Thanks very much for that intro, Mike. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Dale, uh, Dale Humby. I am the CTO and co-founder of a company called Nomenini. And what we do is try and help people across Africa um, ease their lives with payments and, and payment to services in the most rural areas and the most underserved communities. So when I started off my journey at Nomenini a few years ago, I'm back in 2011, and I had this idea in my head, what is scale? And it was like, okay, you come up with this idea, and uh, you put in a lot of efforts, and there's some sort of magic happens, and eventually profit, right? Um, but our journey was rather less um, exhilarating than that. Um, we got to, to scale at some point, and then we crashed and burned due to a couple of errors that we made, and, and just markets in general. And slowly over the last few years, have been clawing ourselves back. So today, over this, um, the next few today and the next few days, when you're listening to a bunch of other speakers um, talking about some fantastic technical topics, think about what scale means to yourself and uh, your own journey to scale, and also realize that um, something getting to scale isn't always um, as obvious as it might seem from the outset. So another company that's struggling with scale is Escom. Right, last year or last month we had um, some rolling blackouts and, and it was a pretty tough environment for, for a lot of South Africans. Uh, if you weren't in the cloud, I'm sure you felt it a whole lot worse than, than the rest of us. Um, but for a moment, I want to take you on a trip to Rwanda. You're going to Kigali and you have to go to a hospital. You, one of your loved ones, is uh, going under critical life-saving surgery. Um, the smell of, of a disinfectant is thick in the air. Um, the heart rate monitors are going. Um, you're on the operating table, and the power goes out. The backup generators don't start. We live on a continent where 55% of Africans, or roughly half a billion people, don't have access to water, electricity, or telecommunications, and live off less than 15 rand per day. That would be like if this whole room represented Africa. You know, maybe we've got South Africa in the front row here, and uh, one person is, is Cape Town. Um, every second person in the audience wouldn't have access to essential services. So what we're doing at Nomenini is giving people reliable access and easy and fast access in the most rural areas to get to essential services uh, by providing payments um, to allow them to buy their services. And through that, governments can then raise money, raise capital to take out loans, and through those loans, um, install that infrastructure because now there's payment processing that's available to them. But we didn't always start with such lofty goals in mind. Um, back in 2011, the, my, one of my best friends and I had Varsity together and we founded Nomenini. Uh, we're sitting around a swimming pool up in Johannesburg with our feet in the water, thinking about um, a journey that he had been on recently where um, he's going to many taxi ranks, the commuters are standing in long queues, um, waiting to buy airtime, buy electricity to take home. And we thought, well, maybe we could um, give everyone makes lives a little bit easier by uh, using a, some sort of point-of-sale terminal in the taxi. Commuters can then buy airtime, buy electricity while they're sitting in a taxi in the traffic anyway, and uh, the taxi driver can earn a little bit more money to take home to their um, family. But I don't know if any of you remember back in 2011, um, smartphones that were available were like lots of buttons, you know, um, Blackberry was still a thing, you had Motorola flip phones were still around, um, nothing that we thought was gonna survive in a taxi environment. So being uh, electrical engineers, mechanical engineer, companies of developers, we decided let's make our own hardware. Um, and that's where we started to develop the Lula. You know, something that was super robust, we can sit in, it can go in a taxi, um, it can survive uh, fire or crashes, um, pretty much be indestructible, and also not distract the driver. You know, we decided to not put a screen on, just a super simple label. So I've got one of my terminals here, and um, for those of you who know the demonstration, you know, we got this, just chuck it on the floor, right? It sort of explodes into a couple of pieces. Some assembly required. Um, give me a second here. Sure. Yeah, the paper normally just pops out, which is painful. 
Um, but if we switch it on, with any luck, right, and it carries on working, right? Um, the door needs to be clipped in, but this would work fairly well. So the idea is that um, this thing could work pretty much anywhere. And what we found, Brenda's reaction was pretty much the same as ours. Uh, super happy with that. Um, and that got us to the first bit of scale as we got rolled it out into the taxis around uh, Johannesburg and in Cape Town. And then we found that it wasn't just staying in the taxi ranks. It was slowly dissipating out into, um, the, uh, into the townships um, and into more rural areas. And there's this one terminal out here in rural KwaZulu-Natal where if you zoom in on Google Earth, you find that it's just this tiny little shop. And we asked that merchant to send us a picture of his store, right? So there's this store in the middle of nowhere. And what we had found, we discovered there's this niche where something with a five-day battery life that was very easy to use, no screen, uh, where you just press the logo for like uh, MTN 5 Rand and some, some, a piece of paper comes out with a pin on, is something that's accessible to many people and useful in rural environments where the cell phone network is spotty um, and, and where the power supply isn't that good. So that got us to our next bit uh, of scale. It started growing up, um, uh, but we were primarily a business-to-consumer relationship. We would supply the terminals directly to um, consumers themselves. And our big learning there was, yo, there are a lot of competitors in this space in South Africa. You know, I think uh, Flash Car, um, which is uh, the bottom right, the top right there, uh, they've got something like 2,000 buckies that drive around South Africa, servicing the merchants, giving them paper, making sure they're okay. They've got a 200-person call center. It's just crazy big. Um, and, and in South Africa, they've been there for many years. There's no hope that a little startup like Nominini could um, compete in that sort of environment. So we decided to branch out and work with distributors to help us scale, so change our business from business to consumer to business to business to consumer, uh, and finding these distributors. And primarily, they were in the rest of Africa. So we started in South Africa and then moved into Mozambique and Namibia, Zambia, Ghana, and Kenya, um, and started scrolling out there. Um, and these were some of our merchants in, in Mozambique. These kids, um, they work after school. Um, they've got the terminals. They run around through the market, selling airtime um, and earning a little bit of money for their families. Um, you'll notice there's a slight plateau over there. Uh, and that process worked pretty well. Um, but we needed electricity. So we started off with, OK, well, how can we turn? We need a screen to capture the meter number. Um, how do we do that? And I don't know if you remember back to your school days, your old sharp calculators or your Casio, you know, those things that would calculate a screen. You could throw them on the floor. It fell out of your space case like dozens of times in a week um, and still survived. So we thought, OK, let's put this screen on. Um, but prior to that, our CEO fell in love with e-paper. So same sort of thing that's on your Kindle. Um, electronic paper basically takes no power to run. Um, it, it does take power when it's refresh, uh, refreshing. Um, but once it's the images on the screen, it just stays there. Um, very low power, almost indestructible. It's flexible. You can stab it with a screwdriver. You can cut the corner off or set it on fire. And that little bit of the screen will break. But otherwise, it just carries on working. Um, so we thought, can we put e-paper into a unit like this, our own terminal? So we could start capturing digits, um, selling electricity, selling um, DSTV, um, and doing cash in and cash out. And from there, um, there was a great project, and, and we managed to sell it to one of our customers, one of the distributors, who ordered pre-ordered 2,000 terminals from us. But the one condition was that we needed to get it to them within six months, and they wanted 500 units right from the start. Um, and that is a big ask, right? You've got six months to deliver a project that is effectively building a computer from scratch. You've got an ARM processor, some RAM that you're putting in there. It's effectively a Linux box that's running high-speed um, traces at a couple of gigahertz. Um, you've got an eight-layer printed circuit board and the plastics that need to be injection molded. Um, and so it's, you know, even if you, you Trying to get parts, it's a three-month lead time just to get parts to South Africa. And on top of that, you've got all the, the, the design work to go. So here's some of our prototypes. On the left is just a 3D printed thing. You can get that in three weeks or so. Um, the injection molding in the middle. Um, and then on the right-hand side, is sort of the final product. So we pushed through, and we got our printed circuit boards built um, by a fantastic company out in Somerset West. 
um, got the injection molding done by an, a company in China. Then three, one of our engineers came back with two suitcases full of plastics, because uh, it was the quickest way to get it into South Africa. Um, and so there's the two units um, next to each other. So and the, the big change with this is it's um, e-paper. So let me... Uh, so you guys can pass that around if you want. Um, that's the demo unit, so you can sell away if you want. Sure. Um, the, so from there, we got it out to Mozambique. Uh, one of the big challenges that we faced was obviously manufacturing at any sort of scale. It's Thomas, our production manager. Um, and we made a couple of mistakes along the way, right? Uh, we developed this unit in the middle of, of uh, June, July in Cape Town. You know, it's rainy weather like uh, today. It's cold outside. Uh, then you're deploying it in December in the middle of, uh, when it's 38 degrees Celsius, almost 100% humidity. The touch sensor was completely um, saturated. You know, we had to build the touch sensor ourselves. Um, and when you're testing it and calibrating it in Cape Town and then taking it to 100% humidity, that uh, sensor we just put on the desk and it started just printing random airtime all on its own. <laughs> uh, so that we, we flew a team of our, our engineers up to um, uh, Maputo and we worked uh, in a basement for three weeks and slowly starting to figure out these problems. Um, so that was pretty successful and through that we got some serious scaling at that time. Um, the the um, client had ordered the 2,000. We delivered well over 1,000 of those units. We had another 2,000, um, oh, 2 million rands worth of parts sitting in storage. Um, and I mean, there was this one case where we needed, we were in such a rush to get a, a production run out that we, we put probably a million rands worth of um, stock into the back of an Uber. So like this Toyota Corolla driving off to the factory. And that's when it kind of dawned on me that Uber is eventually going to win like the, the, or the race to, to do um, high-speed deliveries. You know, you can't compete when it's like next day delivery where you can see your car going to the factory in like 30 minutes. Uh, so for us, it was, it was a big win there. But we made two kind of mistakes. Um, the first one was, oh, sorry, let's talk about the fire hose then quickly. Um, part of that scaling uh, was we started to attract attention from some competitors. Uh, and there are many positives about having asynchronous queues. Uh, for, you know, you can, you can decouple systems, you can replay queues all you want, great things. But for us, there was a competitor that came into one of our clients and said, please, Nominini, send every event that you possibly generate to us. We're going to analyze it. And it's like, okay, you guys, you know, we're generating over a million transactions a day. You sure you can keep up? Yeah, 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 we'll be fine. We're on that other cloud provider. It'll be good. Um, so we can, we switched on the fire hose. And within a few minutes, they just fell over. The database server just froze. And it's okay. They then, our queues started backing up to them, which was fine, because that's why you have them. And slowly, um, we then, okay, they come and recover, eventually open up the fire hose again, 100 transactions a second straight into them, fell over. Eventually, after two weeks, they just disappeared. So I was very pleased that things like queues can just use to fire hose your competition out of the water. But we did make two mistakes. Um, the first one was, we were up, I don't know if you've ever read, have Crossing the Chasm by Jeffrey Moore. Um, fantastic book on how to get a startup from the early stages um, into mass market. And for us, we were mostly hovering around this area, the early adopters and the innovators and working with relatively small um, distributors uh, in various African countries. But what we really wanted was the market, the, more, the, the early majority market to adopt us. But they need reference cases before they can adopt your technology, and they only typically take reference cases from their peers. So they will only take reference cases in here. So there's this chasm that you need to get across, um, and we were struggling to do that. And at the time, we hadn't really figured that out very well. Um, the next challenge that we ran into was Mozambique. We had a massive concentration risk. 80% of our transaction volume went through Mozambique. Um, and their government was caught hiding a billion dollars worth of debt. Um, they had taken out two loans, um, and the one they didn't tell the other, uh, the other lender about. And eventually, the International Monetary Fund found out about this, and that whole economy tanked. Uh, interest rates went from 16% to well over 30%. Um, their uh, currency just crashed. And for us, the, the company that we were working with in here had taken out loans to um, service their business and build up their client base, and they could no longer service that debt. So they started crashing. Um, they, for us, there was this precipitous drop we could see happening in Mozambique. 
Um, every month, for about three or four months, our transaction volume halved and halved and halved. And it was just like, there's nothing that we can do about it. Our CEO flew out there, tried to help them restructure their business, but nothing that we did could really save them from this. So suddenly, we were back um, down at the bottom, uh, where we were two and a half years ago, um, with a staff of engineers and in you know, a company that had been designed to continue scaling. So leading a team through uh, failure um, for those next few months was a big learning experience for me. Uh, first big event was, or idea that we came across was transparency. You know, we're all adults. Every person has got their own career journey that they're on. And for us as a, a leader, a management team, part of the co-founding team, um, to be open with our staff about where we were, um, that we're struggling to, to make payroll, and we don't know what's going to happen with the company, but being open up front so that everybody can make the best decision for themselves. You know, we've all got families, children that we need to look after, and ha having that transparency helped a lot. Um, we had to retrench people, um, or some others just left because they wanted to have something a little bit more stable, but there was a core team that remained. Um, and for those that decided to stay, we yeah, acknowledging the trauma that we had been through. We had put our energy and our soul into this new terminal, and a few months later, it just crashed. Um, it was a commercial failure. Um, and so acknowledging that we had been through this rough ride, having lots of retros and just coffees, and trying to keep that team together um, so we could outride this ourselves. And then the next decision was, are we going to continue or commit? Uh, con continue or close the company? Um, and I guess we, we were very lucky that we had VCs. Um, we've got a number of VCs from Europe who funded us. And the one guy, Vim, he's like the grandfather of the company. And, and he came to us and said, like, look, I believe in what you guys are doing. We will continue to fund you. Yeah, it can't be a lot of money, but we can help you out of the situation if you want to continue. Uh, and it was quite a big decision because you know, you go, you're going back to the beginning again. Think, oh, do I have this in me to go right from the start again? Uh, but ultimately, we decided to continue the company rather than close it. The next big challenge, of course, is leading yourself through failure. Um, out of the world's billionaires, the top 10 billionaires, six of them are tech CEOs or ex-CEOs. They've got a combined wealth of $460 billion, just those top six guys. South Africa's gross domestic product, or the entire output of the whole country, is only seven, 370 billion. So we could all work, the whole country could work, 56 million people could work for an entire year and still not generate the same amount of wealth that these top six tech CEOs have. And that's, for me, part of like the survivor bias. Um, and survivor bias, I guess, can, can best be described from like the Second World War. Um, there was bombing runs happening over Germany, uh, and the Allies were quite rightly asking, how can we protect our bombers from getting shot down? So they, the military engineers, analyzed the pattern of bullet holes, and they said, okay, well, we need to protect our, our aircraft from where they're getting shot. And there was a, a Hungarian, um, Abraham Wald, who was a statistician, and he came back and said at the time, well, actually, we mustn't protect the bombers from where they're getting shot. We must protect the bombers from where they're not getting shot. And that's because what we're, the military was doing is only analyzing the airplanes that arrived back home safely. And so if you've got a bullet hole pattern like this and the airplanes arrive safely, it means that the airplane can safely fly even getting shot in those areas. And the ones that were shot in the other areas didn't return. So there was a survivorship bias that they needed to, to overcome. And for us as um, engineers, you know, we see the survivors who are our tech champions. They are the people that have reached the epitome and, and the companies that are surviving, whether it's our peers or the people right at the top, we see them. Um, and from that point, you know, we, um, Nomenini is often asked, are you guys still a startup? You've been around for eight years. Surely you can't still be starting. Uh, but what is a startup? Eric Ries, from, from, who wrote the, the well-known book, uh, The Lean Startup, describes it as a, a human institution that can deliver new products under extreme uncertainty. Um, if anybody is interested in management science, um, Donald Reinerson is a fantastic author. I can highly recommend this book, um, Product Development Flow. And one of the things that he talks about is that extreme uncertainty. 
Um, and he has got some maths that go into explaining it, but basically he says that you need to aim for a probability of success of over 50% of 50 exactly. If you're going to aim for, um, you, you've got an idea that you want to test, and it's got 90% probability of succeeding, and it succeeds, well, you haven't really learned much. Or if you're going to test an idea that's only got a 10% chance of success, and it fails, you also haven't really learned much. So the optimum position is 50%, um, which is all very well. Um, and it, it like, sounds like, oh, failure is okay, and you know, I can manage that. Um, but when your business is crashing, like all the theory in the world doesn't really make you feel better, but at least intellectually, you can, can justify it to yourself. So we were back there, um, and we decided, okay, never let a serious crisis go to waste. It's an opportunity to do things that you could not do before. And for us, the, we had founded our company on hardware. Uh, we, Nominini was known for these terminals that you can throw down a flight of stairs that is waterproof, it survives in the rain, five-day battery life. Um, and, and that was great. Uh, the challenge for us was we could produce them at maybe $200 per unit, right? Um, back in 2011, Android phones and, and all the smartphones were going for at least $250. But over the next few years, the, the, just the scale came uh, of, of smartphones increased so much that the cost came down to a point where we couldn't compete anymore. You know, even making thousands of terminals a month, you're not going to compete with a mass manufacturer in China on something like cost. Um, so we took the really tough decision of killing our hardware business. Uh, and that meant laying off some of the best engineers I've ever worked with. Uh, you know, we, we've worked with them for so long, and they've developed incredible products, but it, it made the best business sense for us just to, to focus on, on not doing hardware. Uh, also helped with getting funding, because many VCs are just terrified of hardware companies, um, and they're just not going to fund you if, you if they even have hear the word hardware. So switching to a model which they understand, like just pure software as a service, also helped us with fundraising. Um, so we settled on an Android phone, writing an app um, with a Bluetooth printer that we could get combined for like $100. Uh, and this is one of our merchants. Uh, but to do something like that, you know, um, it means that we, we start off with these, these companies who are our uh, distributors in, in the various markets. And, and they're doing well, they're the early adopters. But what we really want to do is get to the big companies, the mobile networks and the banks. And for us, we saw this target market of the banks. Uh, the mobile networks like Safaricom in Kenya, I think, I think is it 50% or more of their GDP, or the transactions, go through M-Pesa every, every year. And that's because they've just swallowed up the market for any sort of mobile payments. And the banks are terrified of this because um, not only the mobile networks are, are allowing you to do payments, but also getting into savings and loans and various other things that have typically been part of the banking space. And finally, the banks are working, waking up and like, okay, we need to get into this agency banking model. Um, but as them, to set up a branch in a rural area is, is far too much money. Even servicing an ATM is way too expensive for them. But can they equip a corner store with a mobile phone and a Bluetooth printer and give that, that person the ability to be effectively a mini bank branch, do withdrawals and deposits, opening up accounts, getting cards? Um, so we decided to move to them. But, of course, we had this problem of crossing the chasm. Um, so you need a unicorn to be able to do that. And, and typically that means someone who these banks are going to view as a peer, so they're going to use the reference case, but someone who's actually living in that early adopter phase. And for us, that was Swazi Bank. It's this tiny, like Swaziland's got 1.3 million people. And I think the whole internet bandwidth of the country is like two megabits a second. It's like crazy, right? And, and they came to us and said, well, we want to get some rural banking. We don't have enough footprint to get our own branches out. Can you come and help us? And for various reasons, I mean, it kind of went through, um, and we got into a pilot phase. But that was enough of a seed for the next biggest bank in Mozambique, who's right next door to Swaziland, to look across and say, okay, we've got the reference case. We're prepared to work with Nomi 
Manini now. Um, and through that helped Mozabanco um, open up agency banking within some of their more rural areas. But going from selling airtime, selling electricity to, to banking transactions, we couldn't use our, our existing back end. I had to go back to the drawing board and think, okay, we need to, you know, App Engine is fantastic, it's running all these transactions, but it's designed purely for airtime. How do we get it to design for, um, for banking transactions? And if you're gonna go back to the drawing board, kind of have a look at what changed over the, in those eight years. And many things changed. If, we, if it could change, we changed it. We went and, and analyzed all the technologies. But some of the highlights was, does anybody use App Engine when it came out, 20, 2009, 2010? Right, this is what the dashboard looked like. Um, and it's since come on and they've got an entire cloud uh, ecosystem which uh, has served us very well. Um, but we wanted to say, do not just be on App Engine, but what about using Docker and Kubernetes that it started to win? Um, there's other things like, well, what about multi-cloud? You know, if you're gonna be working with banks, maybe they want you to run in their own data center. Uh, so we, we focused on that as well, and, and focused on uh, Docker and Kubernetes. We also made the switch from back from NoSQL to SQL. Um, we, we had, uh, used Data Store, um, which is our NoSQL database, and that were, did exactly what it said out of the box. You know, you could run many parallel transactions without any locks or anything, and that, and that worked very well. The trouble for us was extracting that data into something for reporting. Had to build these, these massive uh, MapReduce jobs or having the ETL pipeline, so go from extract uh, out of the Data Store into some sort of reporting database. It was all this overhead, which was just a painful experience. So having a look at, well, if we can design our um, data in such a way, especially using microservices, where each database is segmented, um, or we've also got the benefit that a lot of our client data can live in its own um, namespace, um, so we can learn the full power of using something like MySQL or, or Postgres without having to worry about any particular scaling issues there. Um, and then another big change that we made is from REST to GraphQL. Um, the RESTful APIs, uh, good. I, feel, I can feel like we've actually understood how best to build these things. Um, but a challenge is you've got a phone over a 2G connection trying to, to pull a lot of data, or you've got maybe a field rep who's got a really shitty Android tablet, and now they're trying to like, render a statement for someone. It takes up to 30 um, API calls on REST for us to like, render a rich dashboard. Uh, and that just wasn't working so well over, over the uh, internet. So we decided, okay, maybe switch to GraphQL, a single call um, to a GraphQL API that then fanned out within our high-speed network to go in and fulfill those requests, stitch it all together and return that to the client, uh, which was so successful that we've actually started switching out our internal REST APIs between our services into mostly GraphQL, but um, you know, other companies might choose to use some sort of RPC framework internally or whatever you want to use. Um, but for external clients, it's probably been the single biggest thing that's improved our performance to, to the clients on the front end. But I guess my biggest point is, you know, tools will come and go over any sort of five-year, ten-year period. Um, people get religious about which operating system they're going to use, or which is their favorite language. Those things come and go over our careers. So rather than sweating the tools, focus on the core values of your company. For us, for the development team, it's about continuous delivery, uh, getting value from our um, ideas into the hands of our, our users as quickly as possible. Uh, and that's our core team value. So focusing on that rather than any particular tool. So we had a bit of a, a dip uh, where we were rewriting our back end and slowly have um, climbed um, with Mazabanko into um, into sort of improving a little bit. And I guess on the back of this really successful project, another bank came to us um, who used Mozabanko as a reference case and said, okay, you guys have done so well there. We want to replicate what you've done. And they're so excited about this that they've actually invested in Nominini recently. Um, so as of December, we got a whole bunch more funding um, and they've paid for us to roll out in another five countries over the coming year or two. Um, so hopefully that graph continues to go, go up and to the right and that pile of cash one day. Um, it would be great. <laughs> um, 
in conclusion, I guess, over the next few days, you know, we're going to be sitting and listening to tons of fantastic technical talks, focusing on, on world-changing technology. But as a community, we need to understand that all the great technology in the world is there to help people solve very specific problems. So keep that in mind when you hear the technical talks. How does that, this particular piece of technology, help you help your clients? Thank you very much. Questions? There we go, cool. Do uh, we have any questions on it? Oh. Any questions, yes. So do you just use a mobile for your back end or can you also do Wi-Fi and stuff like that from, the, from your small terminals? Um, the old now, ones? We, yes, you can. Most phones have Wi-Fi built in. Um, but we find that the stores that are, they're operating in, like these little rural corner shops, don't have internet anyway. Um, the mobile network is primarily there, mostly 3G, but you know, we, we sort of work on 2G. But I'm also thinking, you know, in the future, we should even go down to USSD and use that as a bearer. Um, the flip side is, if you do have a, a really good 3G modem in the short store, you can use people using that as a hotspot and then sell airtime as well. So that's a possible experiment for the future. It's actually providing internet to communities. Hi, uh, just a quick question on the GraphQL side. Uh, if you could give pointers or directions in terms of dealing with access control and security patterns on the GraphQL side, if possible. We use, um, sure. We use just very standard session management. Um, so in a header, we send in um, the credentials as a header, um, like a session token. Um, and from that point, when it comes into our, our GraphQL API layer, um, we then validate that session ag internally against our auth service that issued that session, make sure it's still valid. And that auth service then re generates a JWT for internal use, a JSON web token, that's got all the access credentials that all the downstream services then need. And that then is attached to that um, request, and then that's routed internally to the services that are going to then act on that request. Uh, and, but each service only uses that JWT to manage um, its access. We also do other stuff because our, our data is he heavily segmented. Like if you're using the dashboard, so in the merchants is one thing, but if you're a, an employee that needs to use our dashboards to manage thousands of merchants, now they're typically segmented in various ways across geography or like gold, silver, bronze tiers, and stuff like that. Um, so we attach that to the token as well. So, so, so you can see exactly what that person is supposed to see in their scope. Um, so it is a little bit home uh, grown ourselves, but it's specifically for our use case. Um, I'll ask another GraphQL question. I, mean, I think it's a, it's a really good decision to help your client side, but obviously one of the challenges with GraphQL versus REST is caching on server side. I just wonder if you'd had any sort of scaling insights into that, in that, that there is some trade off there that your DB queries tend to get more complex and less cacheable. Sorry, I, I got a bit about oh. caching. Sorry. Oh, sorry, so essentially what I'm saying is that you're trading off a little bit switching from REST to GraphQL sure. in that your database queries tend to be more complex okay. and harder to cache. I was yes. wondering if you'd seen any scaling impact on your server side with this trade off. Sure, yeah. Um, We've chosen to have something that's highly consistent internally rather than deal with caching at this stage um, because there were some cases where, even, uh, where we were caching and the view that the one person had was different from what the merchant had and on a call center that's pretty difficult to try and diagnose a problem. So we've chosen to not have caching at all um, and rather just beef up our databases um, but that's not to say that in the future we're going to regret that decision. Um, uh, so you, 
I can imagine that the biggest bottleneck that you have is a latency of the wire to that endpoint. You want to be as frugal as possible with the data that you send from and to your services to these really remote nodes because of the internet connectivity uh, constraints. Uh, did you find that going to GraphQL um, alone was sufficient, or did you have to have, uh, do further investment in further compressing or constraining what you send over the wire? Um, we use, uh, we do, our clients are very well controlled. You know, it's, a, it's our own app that we write ourselves, and our front end is also something that we write ourselves. So we don't have the, the challenge of dealing with third parties at this stage using our API, so we can avoid some queries that we know specifically that there are these nested queries that will fan out in like an N squared way, uh, and that'll just kill us if somebody runs that query. But we can control for that. Uh, we, uh, our developers that are on the front end in the app use specifically um, stuff that we know is gonna work uh, and only request the data that they need. Um, stuff like compression is built in internally. It just uses uh, the normal HTTP um, compression. Um, and it's not so much the data volume that's the problem, it's actually the latency. So uh, it's just the round trip. You know, we've seen cases where NTP will have I don't know, a two minute delay to get an NTP packet back, and that's like tiny. Uh, and that's just because the mobile networks are very slow at routing traffic sometimes when they get congested. And so it's not so much the data throughput as just like the latency on each request that we optimize for. Uh, this is gonna be a less technical question. Um, how sorry, do you where are you? Um, Over here. Oh, there, sorry. Uh, how did you come about your name and the, the colors for your branding? and Because that's also very important for a company. And obviously, there's always a story behind how you guys actually decide on that, how you came about that. Sure. So, Nomenini in Siswati means anytime. So, our logo right at the beginning was airtime, anytime. Uh, and even to this day, I was up in Johannesburg recently, and someone saw a T-shirt that I was wearing that said Nomenini. It's like, ah, anytime. Um, so that means like, you know, and it's part of our philosophy that people shouldn't have to stand in queues. There are places in, in Zimbabwe where there's one 24-hour store that's open to sell electricity. And if you want to get electricity, you have to stand in a queue before 6 p.m. at the garage waiting for, for airtime when you should be at, or electricity, when you should be at home with your kids or cooking supper or just like being with your family rather than queuing around the block. So our philosophy was we should get that service out to anyone so they don't have to wait. Uh, so that's where the anytime or nomenini came from. Lula means quick and easy. Um, so the, our electronic terminals were all about speed. And part of that speed comes from offline caching. Um, we can have the, the vouchers already on there. So when you press that button, it just comes out immediately. And in the background, synchronizes with the servers to debit and credit counts and everything like that. Um, so the names very much reflect uh, our philosophy of, of just uh, being, getting out of people's way and letting them get on with the job. Oh, color, orange. Ah, that's bright. <laughs> Hi. Hey. Hi, my name is Chastis. Um, first of all, good job. Thank you for your service. Um, all right, my question is sort of non GraphQL related. Um, uh, so, you mentioned that you guys had to sort of look into running a Kubernetes and Docker components potentially on premise where there's sort of a, a bank involved and they want to sort of control the, the access or the, the infrastructure themselves. Did you guys manage to, to go that route? Uh, is there any sort of valuable lessons that you can say that you learned from that experience where you're not controlling, uh, look, on Kubernetes it's very easy to sort of control your own infrastructure and um, stuff that you run on Kubernetes, mm -hmm. but getting Kubernetes up and running yeah. in itself is yeah. hard to sort of virtualize. Um, is there any sort of pointers that you have in that direction? So uh, us running on premises is entirely theoretical at this stage. Uh, we haven't tried to do that and thankfully haven't had the need. So with Swazi Bank, one of the requirements was that we do run on premises because they had such a poor connection to the rest of South Africa and also to where our servers are hosted, you know, not on this continent. Um, 
so we specifically designed our architecture. So there's not anything that's particularly tying us to, to any one cloud or even to the cloud specifically. Uh, our big learning in Mozambique, however, and this is the third largest bank in Mozambique with the disaster recovery site, is their uptime was 90%. So you know, we were getting 99.98% from like our money service and our auth service was like roughly about the same as well for our SLA monitoring. Theirs was 90.1% over any one month period. So they very quickly, once we showed them that how much we were struggling with their uptime, because we have like VPNs connecting to them and stuff, and that we need them to fulfill those transactions because it's actually transacting off a bank account. Once we could prove to them that the, you know, the cloud is the solution, you guys want to be there, not trying to have a disaster recovery you know, fail over, and then we would phone them on a Sunday morning. It's like, you know, your batch job didn't finish last night. You know, your, your whole bank's down. And would rely on Nominini being their insights into their production system. <laughs> and there'd like be a phone call at 11 a.m. and the developer's like, oh yeah, I'm at the office now. You know, can you tell us what's going on? Yeah. And it is just, yeah, so uh, we've decided to stick into a managed solution where in our case, Google uh, Kubernetes Engine runs it. Um, but theoretically, we could run on site if we needed. Hey, Dale. Um, how did you guys deal with uh, stock control? So you know, you, you're vending pins from these terminals, um, and it, you know, it's quite difficult to keep stock of all the pins. There's a cost involved. Um, can you share some of the sort of the approaches and the, the, the science that you guys threw at sort of predicting what you were going to sell? Sure. Um, so just to guys understand how prepaid airtime works, um, as a as a distributor or bulk seller, you go to the mobile network and you buy a CSV. So you pay them a million rand, and then they send you a CSV back with a whole lot of random numbers in it. And those are the PIN numbers, right? So we built a PIN warehouse, effectively, where you drag and drop that CSV. And typically, they, it is encrypted at least, and it, it decrypts that file and then loads it into our database. And then for every merchant that makes a sale, it goes and fetches a PIN and then debits their account and, and then prints out the piece of paper or, or sends someone that, that PIN number. Um, but that stock management, is, as Keith has alluded to, like you've got millions of RAMs sitting on your server. Um, so like the usual stuff of like access control and, and backups and everything on the security side. Um, but what we did do is like, the distributors don't have a lot of money. Um, they typically buy three or five days ahead of time, um, just in time. And if it's at the end of the month, you know, if typically it's a Friday at the end of the month, there's going to be a lot of more sales than on a Wednesday or a Sunday in the middle of the month. So we, we've done our first foray into machine learning to predict what those weekly and monthly cycles are. So we can predict ahead for the operators to see, okay, we need to buy, um, I don't know, 500,000 rand of, of particular Vodacom pins and MTN pins and so on. Uh, and one of the challenges is often the amount that you need for that safety stock is more money than the distributors have. So we do allow them to do some sort of what if analysis. So if you've only got a million rand, how do you best spend it to make sure that you don't run out of stock? Uh, so this is part of our dashboard and our, our service that we um, supply to our customers. So I'm... Um I'm curious about your state of mind in the middle of that growth graph. Like, uh, you must have been super despondent. What, what was it that made you and the, the people who stayed actually continue rather than close up shop? You're right, it was very tough at that point. Um, and almost anything looked easier at that stage. You know, we had been, we had literally built a computer from scratch with a printer and made it waterproof, and then it was a complete commercial failure. Um, and to recover from that was some dig, a deeping dig, digging deep. Um, I think it was the, the friends that we had at Nominini, um, like my co-founder and I, we had been to university together, and he was in it, uh, and that encouraged me, and through the other days, you know, the other way around. And we also had very supportive VCs who even had through the darkest days are like, no, you guys are on the right track. We can see traction here. And yes, there's been some wobbles, but um, you're doing the right thing. Um, don't give up now because you're starting to come out of that. You, you're, you've built a name for yourself and a brand and people trust you. Banks are starting to trust you. If you give up now, all that, that comes before that has been, been wasted. Um, so that helped having very supportive 
senior people who had been through that same journey that we had been uh, multiple times in their careers. Um, Hannes van Rensburg, who's um, started, what is it? Uh, he's, yeah, Fundamo, that's it. And he's on our board as well, and he's been through this journey. Um, Vim, who's one of our VCs, he was also there. Um, so we had these, these uh, mentors who helped us a lot. Um, so I think having a support network is very important. Uh, hi there, I have a question around uh, security. So we've, we've heard that uh, your clients have some of your devices on site, the fact that there's some offline caching, the fact that the pins come through in CSV format. Have you guys run into any security issues around your systems? Or if not, what would you expect there might be? Um, a lot of our, the people in the field aren't particularly sophisticated cyber criminals. Um, we, we had the one case where we got a terminal back and the complete, the front of it was scrawled off of a screwdriver and when we eventually recovered the terminal and the person who was doing this, like, what were you thinking? He's like, no, I wanted to get the pins out of it. So, you know, there's like this, this disconnect that the pins are like accessible. I, I don't know how that works, but that was the, the mental model that we're dealing with. Um, Secondly, the biggest um, security uh, vulnerability is actually fraud. Um, you have someone who's a, a trader, and then they take the terminal home in the evening. And even though we've got a PIN number on the terminal, um, the kids in that family know what that PIN number is. And if you've got a, a kid who's maybe addicted to drugs or something, they will then steal that terminal, print off a bunch of airtime, and sell it. So that threat is mostly internal from, from friends and family. Um, the terminal itself was very well secured. Um, we used an um, ARM secure boot and, and it verified the, the binaries and everything, so there isn't really much threat from that. Um, but when we switched to Android, um, there's, there's a much broader attack surface. And so we decided not to do any offline caching on the Android terminal itself. So everything is done server-side, um, and you need a valid session and login. So, but of course, the vulnerability is still if somebody knows what your PIN number is to get access to the service. Um, but everything else is now done server-side. Cool. Hi. Hey. Uh, just a question about like scale in countries. Um, do you work a lot in South Africa? Like we've got um, South Africans' regulations are quite advanced. Almost we've got FICA and know your customers and those things. We actually have to verify who you're selling mm -hmm. to. Do you find those kind of challenges in other countries? Um, is it getting easier? Is it getting harder? Mm -hmm. And if you get to that kind of like we have certain laws that say you can't like host stuff in. If you're a financial company, you can't host stuff in American servers. Sure. Would, do you find that kind of information or struggles on your side? With it, we pulled out of South Africa because of the competition space you know, with uh, Kazang and OneCell. So we, we decided to focus on the rest of Africa because what we had is a, a technology solution that was multi-tenant. And a lot of the other companies had built something that worked specifically for South Africa and they couldn't move into other African countries. So we decided to pull out of South Africa and focus on, on other countries. Um, but largely things like uh, FICA is the same across the world. And there's different levels of FICA that we've come through. Um, so like in Zambia, um, we operate below a certain level. That means that the, the validation is, is pretty simple. Um, there's a form, it's a copy of an ID, and somebody can just check it visually. There's nothing more complex than that. But if we were, um, and so we have these different tiers of merchants. And it's like the street sellers, there's basically no FICA, it's very lightweight. But if you want to open up a bank account and our system to operate off your business bank account rather than like a mobile wallet, um, then they have to be FICA'd within the bank. Uh, but that's more of a barrier to entry. So you find someone like a, who owns a shop or maybe a pharmacy, they can get that FICA requirement. Um, and so we just rely on the bank to, to do that. And for ourselves, um, the lightweight FICA for our terminals is, is pretty simple. So it hasn't been a, a barrier for us. Um, as in terms of the, the data, uh, where it can live, we haven't run into any problems there. Um, a couple of African countries insisted like, that the pins live within the country, and if you're going to take it across the border, then there's an export tax and an import tax, and we decided those sorts of markets are just too difficult to operate in right now, and we'd rather focus on other places that have got just as much benefit for us. 
Okay, last question down the front. So, I, I think for a company to go through a journey like this is quite admirable. And um, having a look at yourself and the industry and everything like that, uh, especially when it comes to like these uh, survivability biases, right? Mm -hmm. well, what would you say is maybe one or two of the key things that really kept you guys pointed to True North. You've touched on some of the some of the support you guys had and uh, some of the friendships. What else is there that really kind of pulled you guys through that really made this journey worthwhile and yeah. got you guys back going into a positive direction? Sure. Um, I think our customer base. You know, we had touched, been on so many field visits into to Ghana, into Zambia, and you're going into these rural areas where it takes you two or three hours to drive out there, and there's this tiny little shop with some wire mesh on the window, and there's ladies selling um, Coca-Cola and knickknacks and airtime. And everybody knows her in the village because that's the place where you come and you get your airtime, you get your electricity. And that reliability is something that people understand and get. And then taking that a step further, where now you can turn that shop into a bank, um, or at least a little bank branch, where people, you know, I often thought, like, sure, you're gonna go and deposit a week's wage at, like, a guy at the traffic lights, you know? uh, or a um, plastic umbrella with a, uh, 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 you think, sure, are these people trustworthy? But they live in that community. They are there, everybody knows them. They've been, their families live there, the other families live around. Um, so there's like this, this community, and you can see a very positive impact um, that you're making on people's lives. And for us, it was just being reminded of, of people who we're helping has been a, a big North Star for us. Great, so thanks. Cool. Let's, let's thank Dale. Thank you, guys.